Hi, and welcome to another Lympha Press educational webinar. You know, I have a wish list of people that I've been wanting to work with, and so I'm especially delighted to welcome Paula Donahue today. I want to read her intro, but first I want to welcome all of you and thank you for being here, giving us your time. We know that you are devoted to learning more about lymphedema and you will learn more today. Please let us know you're with us in chat and also please put your questions in the Q&A and at the end of Paula's presentation, we'll get to those. This webinar is being recorded. So I can assure you that if you didn't get everything the first time around, you will be given a link to the replay once we edit in graphics and all that good stuff. So thank you again for being here. And let me introduce Paula Donahue, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and a physical therapist level four at Vanderbilt Diani Center for Health and Wellness. She received her bachelor's of science from Duke University, her DPT from Northwestern University Physical Therapy and Human Movement Sciences, and her MBA from the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. I could go on and on and take up this whole webinar just giving your intro, Paula, but you primarily for our purposes today, a certified lymphedema therapist specializing in the treatment of lymphedema, lipedema and oncology rehabilitation, engaging in related clinical care and research. Now today, we are going to be talking about effective swelling management. We use the term first aid for lymphedema patients, but the bottom line is if swelling isn't handled and addressed, things can get worse and we don't want them to get worse. So with that, Paula, I'm gonna ask you to take it away. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, again, I'm Paula. Thank you, Brenda, for inviting me to talk tonight. And thank you everyone for, for joining me. I wish that I could see everyone and we sort of were in a in-person situation because I find this conversations to be very um, dynamic and I would love to maybe engage if we can uh, following my rolling out of the presentation since we can't be interactive. Uh, what your experiences are. I would absolutely love to, to, to hear it. So we'll just kind of get on and, and roll on with tonight. And in, uh, as Brenda had mentioned, we're going to be talking about like that first aid component to um, post-trauma swelling. What do we do with management? And also post-operative swelling. What do we do with management? I, um, oops, let me see if I can get myself started with clicking forward here. Oh, there we go. Okay. These are my disclosures. I don't really think any of them um, negatively impact tonight, but I want everyone to be aware. And then again, for the objectives, we'll look at just having this conversation about the earliest of earliest swelling management in a client in client house that we are not, um, when I think of lymphedema and when I feel like when I talk with fellows and medical students and other physicians and other clinicians in the whole continuum of care, they think of lymphedema as something different, maybe cancer related, maybe primary, um, something that's super chronic. And uh, we don't even have to be calling anything lymphedema. That's a chronic state. We'd be dealing with the lymphatics and supporting the lymphatics um, postoperatively, as well as um, following any trauma to optimize patient care. So with that, I'm gonna pepper in some key points when we're sort of dis discussing with some of our referring providers. For any of you out there that are in more of a, a university medical center setting, there's a lot of different opportunities for being able to outreach, however, even within the community, or if any of you are working within the school systems or working with athletic trainers um, at the side with sports medicine, um, there's just a wealth of opportunity uh, as to how we could potentially infiltrate our knowledge as lymphedema therapists towards other clinicians for optimizing the patient care that we that any of us provide our patients. And so at the very end, I guess the underlying thread is changing the status quo to swelling management. Um, I've been a clinician for very long. Uh, I've enjoyed it. There's been a lot of changes, especially with the lymphatics, which has been quite ex um, exciting since I have started my practice. But um, in general, my general sense is, not to stereotype anything, but my general sense is when we know and can expect swelling from an acute injury or from a surgery, it's it seems like it's easy for us as clinicians to just sort of accept it, knowing that the lymphatic system that's otherwise normal 
we'll take care of the problem. Um, maybe we'll do a little bit of support behind it, but it'll just take care of the problem. And so we sort of watch and wait for that to happen instead of being more proactive. Um, in general, I know I'm preaching to the choir. So the concept behind it is more of to discuss and to sort of bring into the knowledge that we kind of know and sort of forget that it's not, uh, we think it's such common knowledge that we sort of forget that patients and or other physicians, clinicians, and even patients aren't um, readily aware of it, or at least I feel like I sometimes do. Um, but let's kind of get into it. So I know we've all seen this before. Uh, what we've managed and how we would manage something along this line. That's not actually what we're going to be talking about um, during today's uh, session. And I think we all probably have a fantastic understanding about how edema impacts a patient's pain, potentially, um, and range of motion for just fully engaging and stretching those joints um, to end range in either direction or any of its rotational motions that it's permitted for. Um, and along with that, uh, there's just the pain that is impacted when range of motion is reduced from the swelling. And then of course, the natural segue to impacting a person's function. And when a person's function is impacted, especially if they're a mover and a shaker, they are gonna the patient's gonna naturally find compensatory strategies. And I'm sure we have many of thoughts of stories of patients where they didn't even realize that they were compensating. And however long that compensation goes on for, then there might be a chain effect of other um, musculoskeletal problems that come into play um, down the road. So swelling, how is swelling limiting um, the progress for all of this? I'm sure with all of us on the call here, we look to the left. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but as we look to the left and you can see this wound, how um, we probably can easily appreciate the swelling that exists within this patient's leg. Um, we can see the exudate that's kind of on that um, dressing that's been removed. And we can probably just imagine about how much faster that wound would heal if we could address that swelling more effectively or even just start to address the swelling. Then to the right, the classic concept of a, a total knee replacement. And that actually used to be something I used to do all the time when I was first uh, a therapist and I loved doing it. We were very aggressive um, with that treatment intervention and getting patients up and walking day of surgery and out the door for outpatient. But we'll talk more about this um, for, for our immediate management because us as lymphedema therapists and looking at that knee, we probably have some ideas of helping the patient early on after surgery and wherever they are in their continuum of rehab um, for optimizing their movement, reducing their pain through some things that we take for um, granted, knowing about the lymphatic system and how to help support it. Oh, good. So I forgot I brought on those green arrows. And then even with some more um, subtle swelling, kind of looking at this picture after carpal tunnel um, surgery, I'm sure you all probably have had one or many uh, patients come to your to you in clinic and express to you how they're a bit confused um, that the, the other referring provider, clinician, surgeon doesn't really think the swelling's that big of a deal or not even sure they have much swelling, but the patient can feel it. Uh, you can probably palpate and see it, but um, many a times uh, subtle swelling kind of just goes under the radar for if we address it, how much better the patient could could feel or function early on. So why manage post-operative trauma, post-operative swelling? Um, again, I know that these are things that are very obvious to everyone on the call. The reason why I wanted to bring these pieces up is these are the conversations that we can have with um, referring providers, other clinicians, however they come across your plate or in reaching out to potential referring providers. Uh, we want to Everyone wants to optimize the speed of recovery for patients. I know that's a given within clinicians. I think sometimes it's, it's so easily overlooked. And I've learned over the years, clinicians don't know what they don't know until they realize that they didn't know something. And they could have learned something through patients coming back and saying, hey, this is what I just had happen. And, and it was amazing. Um, or from clinicians where clinician, they're referring them out, let's say to a therapist, and then a therapist has um, 
the knowledge base to support the lymphatic system pretty effectively. And then the patient goes back to the referring provider and has a positive experience with that. Uh, we'll kind of get into some specific examples. And then I would love to uh, talk about any of your specific examples um, following my presentation. But ultimately, we'd be looking at supporting the lymphatic system to optimize pain, address pain, or maybe even prevent pain, uh, to optimize the range of motion by reducing the amount of swelling that's around in space, um, to return that patient back to their previous baseline function as fast as possible, uh, whether that be back to work, school, uh, back to a sport, uh, we're in sports medicine, or actually I had one um, clinician mentioned to me a long time ago. She said, I pretty much view every person as an athlete. They're an athlete wherever they are, whether it's getting out of that bed and being able to stand up and walk across um, that room to the other side, or if they are playing a 90 minute uh, soccer game. But I thought that was actually kind of cool way to look at um, every individual in their rehabilitation process. Just might look a little bit different as to how we rehab them. And then of course, reducing that potential for compensatory strategies that people will naturally adapt uh, to just get by and keep going. So I'm gonna kind of go through a little bit of the literature and what's interesting is there's not much of it or there's a lot of it, but it's inconclusive and it's kind of all over the map. And that's not uh, uncommon in many of the areas of physical therapy or in general with clinical care. So it's not really a knock on where the literature has been. It's just that's sort of the overarching uh, piece for right now. And I have a feeling maybe with time and with the new knowledge that we have about the lymphatic system, I, I have a feeling it'll continue to uh, improve and be valuable for use. So what we're looking at here is, a, is a, uh, a manuscript on the effectiveness of using manual lymphatic drainage um, with orthopedic injuries. I loved running across this one mainly because it's highlighting the uh, stimulation of the lymphatic system. And here um, they theorize that delaying that removal of edema will increase that sec will increase secondary injury and result in a longer recovery period. So ultimately the faster that we can kind of get at uh, helping the, support the lymphatic system to do what it needs to do to help that patient's um, injury or their post, uh, well, here it's an, it's an injury, uh, to help that injury along, uh, then more for the better. So it's kind of just highlighting that one. Here's another study where they're actually looking at um, pneumatic compression devices and finding that with knee arthritis, the incorporation of pneumatic compression device helped to reduce um, knee swelling, which uh, was also rather exciting to sort of see that. They were comparing it to, um, where they were using it along with the conventional treatments with cold pack and looking to see how those outcomes uh, were different. And again, their results ultimately identified that it was a value behind having pneumatic compression device. And as the different companies like LymphoPress have been putting out research, uh, the, we've been noticing more and more efficacy for using pneumatic compression pumps. This also, I felt like, follows suit with helping to stimulate the lymphatic system. So the nice thing behind a device is where if a patient caregiver or anyone else isn't sure what to do, it's sort of like the device just kind of takes care of it. Um, alternative to that, uh, to, a de to a de the device is teaching patients and caregivers how to stimulate the lymphatic system uh, for wherever their injury is. This um, study is actually, it's a review. Uh, this manuscript looks at cold compression in the management of musculoskeletal injuries and orthopedic um, operative procedures. It's sort of a, a narrative and it looks at, I think I might've highlighted something here. Yep, here we go. So cold and compression routinely are used um, after acute care injury. We all sort of know that. And we, we probably have experienced that or seen uh, people try to do that. So they're trying to alleviate pain by doing these um, interventions, reduce swelling, and speed up recovery. And why I wanted to highlight here is that swelling range of motion um, in this particular review were inconsistent and divergent. So ultimately, the reviewer article found that it was difficult to recommend the most appropriate, effective clinical application of cold and compression. So though it seems confusing, it's like, well, what do we do? And in the absence of finding 
or having inconsistent evidence doesn't lead to not providing the evidence. It's more of a potential call for, hey, how have we designed the studies? What's that study design look like? What do we need in order to, whatever that area is, fill in those missing blanks uh, to be able to feel more confident about whether or not the application is more effective or not. I think probably all of us on this call are also familiar with the inconsistencies that have been in the past um, and sort of probably continue on with the manual lymphatic drainage that's provided for um, addressing lymphedema and whether or not it's effective for higher stages of lymphedema where fibrosis is more into play. But where we've been able to see through other research with the manual lymphatic drainage that higher pressures towards more fibrotic areas have a better impact. It's, I feel like similar when I've been reviewing this literature for the injuries and also the post-operative swelling is that it's not quite there yet. So by it being inconsistent doesn't necessarily make any um, claims just yet. It's just sort of a, hmm, let's pause and uh, keep moving forward. I also have found clinically um, in the application when patients improve, I'm really mostly interested in that person that's in front of me. So even though the literature doesn't show it just yet, if it's working for that N of one, the patient that's in front of me, seems like it's a good idea, at least for that particular patient. Another article uh, is, oh, this is another review article. And if I, I, I like actually all of the articles, but this one was 2020. And the neat part about it is I thought they did an excellent job. They set this review article up very well for trying to find the most um, impactful studies that were done responsibly and that they would be able to compare together. Uh, their objective was to actually look at compression wrapping and um, as it says in the title for acute closed extremity joint injuries. So they were actually looking for it across the continuum of any type of extremity joint injury. It's, it's a closed um, injury and it was acute. Uh, and, and so they, they were looking for it all across the board, but I think I've got it here next. Their conclusions were, look, were finding that, again, it was a systematic review. It was demonstrating that compression itself was inconclusive. So it wasn't necessarily beneficial um, with looking at the review articles, but it was, did not have a harmful effect either. Uh, compared to no compression at all. They were looking for studies that had that, as well as studies that were using other types of um, non-compressive stockings, but the splint, a brace, and they wanted specifically to try to target this first aid treatment, the first people to get to an athlete or a person who's injured and start to provide some type of care for them. I've got um, a couple more slides actually specifically with this review article. Something that they highlighted was uh, many things that we probably have um, heard and seen for a long time, like rice, which indicates that rice ice compression elevation. And it's sort of like an alphabet soup here with then adding price where protection is um, included and police where it adds in optimal loading. And then I kind of loved peace and love, which honestly I had never heard until I read this article. Um, but I, we knew, you know, probably I know about use of anti-inflammatories, but this acronym for peace and love brings in the elevation, the, well, all of them have elevation, but anti-inflammatories, education, load, optimism, vascularization, and of course with exercise. So what they had said is in this article, which I fully, um, I guess I never really sat through and looked at all these different alphabet soups that have come out um, for trying to manage the immediate acute injury, but compression is within all of them, uh, which is kind of fun. It's like, that's the one component that sort of seems to stick. Uh, elevation also sticks, but I'm gonna kind of go through that in a moment. So key points here from their review article is that they were addressing the theoretical components of why use compression uh, to limit the amount of edema caused by um, damaged capillaries. So those damaged capillaries are releasing a lot of exudates um, into that space. And then the lymphatic system is the one that has to deal with it. I'll get back to that in a moment. I know that all of you on this call already inherently know that without my even saying that, that's going to be a key component as we talk to our non-lymphedema clinicians, because that's still a concept that isn't well recognized, understood, and even in the current medical um, training for our 
medical students. It's not something that's kind of coming across crystal clear just yet. Uh, the other uh, theory behind the use of compression is to prevent po uh, possible hypoxic damage to the nearby tissue. They, as I had mentioned, found inconclusive results from the literature. What I hadn't mentioned to you is they took 1,193 uh, 1, articles, and in they're trying to find ones that are of high level or of highest level possible evidence. So hold that thought, highest level possible that's already out there. Um, evidence went down to eight articles, and all of those articles happened to be ankle injuries. Um, fascinating, huh? So they were out to try to look for where's what's in the, the literature on any type of joint injury, and they kind of drilled down to, sadly, only being able to report on ankle injuries. Um, and it was regarding pain, swelling, function, and, rain, and range of motion that they were looking at for the, the, the eight articles um, that they pulled in. So then they also highlighted the limitations. And I, I have to admit, this is a well-written article, in my opinion, and I um, thought they were very good at just sort of laying out there what, what is there and, and all being transparent for how they went through this review article. And in reading and looking at their limitations, I think I might've highlighted a few, yeah. Um, the authors, they, um, in most studies, authors provided no explanation of how much pressure was applied using the compression or those elastic bandages. Um, how the wrap was applied, whether the pressure was circumferential or sequential, and how long the compression bandage was worn. And hearing all of this, and as again, being lymphedema therapist, where we probably had many patients come in with inadequate or inappropriate compression um, being used, we can probably all kind of think, yeah, that matters. How can we compare and look at studies and actually look at outcomes if we don't know what that looks like? And that, um, we can feel confident that whatever compression was being utilized was adequate compression um, for whatever that situation was. So all of these things can be confounding factors. Um, they were really aiming in this study to be able to look at the first aid response. And um, this other space here, I wanted to just highlight what they put for their future directions. Really what it gets down to is just more research is needed. Um, to try to address these confounding factors. And then in particular, since they were aiming to try to get to the, on the fields with the athletic trainers kind of scenario, how to maybe um, look for or, or, or create research that actually is at that point of care and not already in the hospital setting point of care. Uh, there, I think it's at the very bottom here on the right, you might be able to see, uh, they were, um, part of an ILCOR first aid task force. So they, it seemed as if the authors kind of already knew the huge value behind use of compression and early on and adequate amount of compression, where it seemed like they were looking for trying to help with guidelines in this first aid task force. So that was the outcome for their, their findings. So now going back to what we've already been looking at, the alphabet soup, I have a little bit more of these items colored here. I have elevation with a gentle cross out. And the only reason why I put that there is as lymphedema therapists and many others, we probably recognize the difficulties of people adequately elevating. Um, it's hard to, I don't know if any of us here on the call have been injured where we needed to elevate, but if a person's a mover and a shaker and they wanna get back to doing as much as they can, elevation usually either becomes an afterthought, like, oh yeah, I didn't elevate, or it's just a difficult thing to really do adequately for a period of time that's needed, especially when there's not compression applied. And as we probably all know on this call, when compression is inadequately um, applied, meaning like a lower level of compression, that's not going to be sufficient. So if we have adequate compression applied, potentially, we don't need to worry so much about the elevation. Also, I've got protection here as a red, um, just to highlight it, because it's seen as a huge benefit for early um, management. With adequate compression, oftentimes provides wonderful protection to wherever that compression is over. Um, so it might even be that we might start to find, hey, when we start to do some adequate amount of compression, we have all these other features kind of somehow covered. Then I've got some other lights, not, um, other of these features highlighted because in what we do with our patients, we're doing 
probably all of these as well. We're going to help train those patients for their optimal loading. We're going to then provide the education for that patient on how to pace progress back to wherever they're kind of needing. And any of that movement and exercise is going to help for revascularization while also supporting the lymphatic system to where the lymphatic system needs to be supported for adequate um, edema management, or hopefully it stays uh, decongested while even the, the individual is trying to get back up and moving towards their baseline. So now I'm gonna kind of segue and move towards a case report. Um, and here, this case report is on hematoma trauma. I'm gonna show up an MRI. Um, this is a cross-sectional of a calf. And if you can kind of appreciate here, uh, my cursor is going around the size of the hematoma that's within the, the calf space. And um, if you're not used to reading MRIs in this calf area, here we've got medial, um, lots of th this uh, hyperintensity is indicative of the swelling and the trauma that's occurred to this space. And here's another look for um, it being more of a sagittal view. Uh, and ultimately here, we can probably appreciate that this is the calf. So this is the cross-sectional of where the calf and the hematoma is right here in this space. And also, again, you can probably appreciate all of the um, extra fluid and trauma that's around in that tissue um, due to this injury. And what's interesting about this case report that I just wanted to highlight is that the radiologist could not believe that this, this was a 10 day old injury and the person wasn't healing adequately. It was just sort of a strange thing. Pain was better and then pain started to get worse. So ultimately through a number of different imagings um, from ultrasounds, it kind of ended up moving towards, okay, we need to do an MRI on this, on this patient. And what the radiologist had pointed out to me is they said, you know, because so the injury was caused by um, a knife getting into the calf area. Um, it was through an accident. It wasn't an intentional um, stabbing. But in this space, the radiologist was saying from the skin area, because here's the skin, would have expected more um, trauma where they he can usually see that entry point and he was completely flabbergasted as to how um, there wasn't the, the usual for what he would see on the superficial skin space, but yet just this massive um, hematoma that they ended up the next day surgically removing um, to help this patient function better because it was just sort of um, encapsulated at this point. But uh, the fallback behind it was this patient had been given immediate adequate compression. And this patient was also given and trained for use of kinesio tape along the skin, not going over where the stitches were from um, closing up where the, the um, knife wound had, gone, had entered into the skin. But 10 days later, and it was fascinating to me to see a radiologist needing to pull me aside to find out what this patient had been doing because he didn't understand how he wasn't seeing more trauma to the skin and the other area. It was, there's deep trauma, but he was confused as to why there wasn't more trauma. And also, no, it's not a pre, you can't really appreciate it through the MRIs, but this patient had no visible swelling. Um, so it was all very perplexing to everybody else on the outside, but probably for, for you all on this call hearing, well, that person got into adequate compression straight away to help prevent that swelling and use of kinesio tape to help the lymphatic system optimize as quickly as possible. Maybe it's not so much of a surprise. Now with all of my um, little examples that I'm gonna throw in here, they are ends of one. So their case reports, we hold them with an open hand. If we would do this for a hundred people, I would be fascinated by it and uh, to see what those outcomes are. But it's important to just kind of recognize these are case reports, but they kind of lead towards maybe that food for thought or consideration of um, we're helping the lymphatic system and the lymphatic system's what's needing um, to, to sort of help support that patient in their healing process. Oh, sorry, I forgot about my errors. Okay, so now let's move a little bit into post-op. We were talking trauma. So now we'll kind of talk a little bit about post-operative swelling management. And here is an interesting article where they were talking about using compression to help reduce the hemorrhage following varicose vein surgery. Maybe many of our patients with or without um, primary secondary lymphedema um, have gone to, have um, had varicose vein surgeries. 
And here they found that the use of compression, oops, I thought I had highlighted, the use of compression had helped to reduce the hematomas. And one little insert for one of my patients who happened to be a lymphedema patient from cancer. She also on her um, leg lymphedema aside from cancer, she, uh, she needed to have varicose vein procedure done as well as the opposite side. So she ended up having both of those legs um, with, the, with these varicose vein uh, surgeries that were performed. But I wanna emphasize that she had already learned with her husband how to adequately apply compression and with the short stretch bandages. And then also she had already transitioned into phase two. So she had 30, 40 compression garments. And ultimately when she had her surgeries, the doc said, you know, go ahead and put on, they gave her TED hose. And she said, no, we're going to wrap my leg right away. And then she moved from wrapping her legs to her, um, her uh, compression garments that were 30, 40. She goes back into her post-op visit with her doc about a week later. And the nurses in the doc were completely befuddled that she had no, no bruising. <laughs> and it was just one of those things. She was so proud of herself because she goes, I know, and I know why I don't have any bruising because I learned from my lymphedema therapist that I got to support the lymphatic system and bruising is reuptaked by the lymph. The lymphatics help to, to prevent or to reuptake any bruising. So she told me ever since then, those docs, um, they order their patients 30, 40 compression garments. They get them fitted beforehand and they get them into it instead of using the TED hoods. That was kind of a fun story. She was super proud of herself. But these are like different opportunities where as we look to try to help train our fellow colleagues where they're doing the best that they can and they're trying to think of it, but they just don't, you don't know what you don't know until you experience it. So our patients can kind of help to inform and to um, create trend and changes um, as well. So it's kind of fun. So here's another article that I thought was neat because it's actually looking for mandibular fractures um, and, it, and it, it's a surgery. So that's why I put in the post-op spot. So it's, it's an open reduction internal fixation from mand mandibular um, fractures. They used um, kinesio tape. Well, we all know what kinesio tape does, but I know in the general community, it's not necessarily understood. So their, the purpose of their study was to um, determine whether or not kinesio tape would help to reduce swelling, pain, and also they were looking at trismus following these procedures. And their results found that there was a statistically significant influence on that tissue reaction and their swelling but there was no significant influence on pain control. However, for those patients that had the kinesio tape applied, they had a perceived improve, um, improvement by having a lower morta morbidity complaints and, and issues. So on that end, they actually had a positive piece, even though pain control itself didn't seem to have anything significant. And um, in their conclusions, they found that use of kinesio tape improved the patient's quality of life. About actually, that's another piece. And these are just things where we know the support of the lymphatic system. And there's a lot of different potential applications of how we could support the lymphatic system um, during the healing process. So with compression, um, reduces venous reflux, augments arterial circulation. I guess we're talking mostly also about the legs here. Um, enhances fluid reabsorption wherever it is. Assists that patient or person with um, support and potential pain control. And then with all of that, with adequate compression, does it expedite return to function? Still a huge question mark, um, potentially with all of these, from what I had just laid out where the literature doesn't have anything conclusive. But as we move forward and as there's further um, knowledge base behind lymphatic support, and what that will do is that will probably trickle further into the research side of things where then it's a focus for adequate lymphatic support and we might be able to ascertain, you know, the, the benefits or, um, or if there are no benefits, I'm open to that. I just haven't seen it clinically. So, but I'm definitely open to it. If, uh, if a study were to be well-designed and kind of come come away with that. Um, so when we talk with providers, uh, you probably have had many of these conversations. They're like, what kind of compression? Uh, how, how much compression do I apply? What are the materials that are sort of out there? That's where it's going to depend on what we're talking with that provider about. So we could be talking about an individual patient, of course, but we would also 
um, if we're helping providers with optimizing their post-surgery following a total knee replacement. Well, that would be different than a, optimizing a, a hand surgeon following their, um, their carpal tunnel or any of their hand procedures that they're doing. But it's sort of looking at these different opportunities. Um, those were just um, post-op examples. But then if we're in a space or we have an ability to, to collaborate with clinicians who are first liners with um, uh, first providing first aid to people, there's totally different opportunities as well. So it kind of just depends. I know every one of us on the call kind of knows how to adapt um, and, and where things are. And it also depends on that patient as well. But I think that none of this is too complicated for others to learn, especially in their area of specialty or where they're providing it. They just hadn't necessarily been around the lymphatic space very much in their training, especially where they came out from their training and also where they're being influenced in their practice, who they're kind of working with. You know, we just sort of, it's very easy for us to accidentally get into our silos. And the more that we're out there with um, other clinicians, we, we learn a lot. The other day I was working with one of our plastic surgeons and I learned a lot just listening to him talk to one of his patients. I mean, there's it's a give and take. There's always opportunities for learning. Um, but the key pieces behind it would be sort of addressing these key questions about compression that I'd like to also throw in the concepts that we've just talked about too, with stimulating the lymphatic system, teaching patients um, and caregivers how to do that, application of kinesio tape where it might be appropriate, and use of the pneumatic compression devices, um, if that's also something that would be appropriate and possible um, in more of an acute phase or a post-operative phase. Okay, so I've included these next few slides because they're more on the lymphatic system, mainly because I know we know it, but if it's at all useful for, um, for you and your dialogue with other providers, by all means, uh, take it um, for what you need. So with the lymphatic system, we know that it is um, involved 100% responsible for homeostasis, special, especially for the limbs. And we know it's an immune function um, support, and it's also got the fatty acid absorption and fat transport. Big one there where a lot of clinicians are not fully aware of is its responsibility for homeostasis and maintaining that. Um, this picture is probably something we're extremely familiar with, but um, I use it to help clinicians visualize why skin stretches help to stimulate the lymphatic system um, on the, mostly for those anchoring filaments and how it can kind of help open up that space. Um, and then I think it's also useful in the conversation that I've had where when we stretch the skin or when we have our patients move and so those lymphatic vessels get stretched, then we've got this smooth muscle contraction that's occurring because that's its pump. It's not, it's not part of the central um, pump system. It's got its internal pump. And when it is um, moved and mobilized, it gets stretched. And we can manually increase that activity through skin stretches, which is, um, we take, might take for granted, but again, a lot of clinicians and patients don't, are not aware of it. Um, so no central pump. We know that there's valves that help prevent backflow. Uh, local pressures are very good at helping to stimulate the lymphatic system. So bringing in the diaphragmatic breathing being another one there. Um, and then pressure is exerted on the tissues. So that compression component, and then our manual techniques for stimulating lymphangiomotoricity. So just a different piece to kind of talk with providers about. Um, not sure how many uh, providers were or are um, aware of the Starling principle even. So it kind of just depends where they had gotten their training and what they were, what they retained. I didn't retain a lot of organic chemistry. So there's a lot of things I haven't retained because I haven't used it. So if the Starling principle is helpful and it kind of reaches to, to people to understand back in the day, we actually thought that 90% of it was um, reabsorbed, through the, pushed back through the capillaries and um, reabsor reabsorbed by the, the veins versus only 10% was um, through the lymphatic channel, then this might be of help where then you can pop in the revised model for the Starling um, principle. And really the big pieces are, yeah, the glycocalyx model doesn't really, uh, the glycocalyx doesn't allow for that re-entry back into the, uh, the venous system. And so with that, 
that's turned into 100% reabsorption from the lymphatics. Another way to look at it, instead of all those busy slides that I've used with clinicians before, is sort of this, um, uh, just this quick highlight of, on the left, we got the classic model for the styling principle, 10% um, lymphatics, 90% venous um, for responsibility as a fluid reabsorption. But now we know it's the right side. It is 100% the lymphatics, which usually blows even some of our medical students um, or no, they're even further along. We see mostly residents and, and fellows in our clinic. They come to observe what we're doing. And, you know, I love asking just because I want to be in the know. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when I've got someone who already knew this information well, because then that will start to tell me, right, this is infiltrating more of the medical field. And it's, it's really just more of a limitation to who the uh, physicians or who the different individuals are that are providing that education. And until that becomes um, more ingrained and in, in the forefront, or you bring in a, a lymphatic physician experts to kind of be able to be training um, or providing some of the content, then I think it'll start uh, happening. So and, and in general, I think it's happening. It's just uh, feels like a snail's pace sometimes. Um, whoops. So this piece here um, is another component that we talk with the docs and, and other folks about just sort of now with that revised Starling's um, uh, law that if you've got chronic edema, well, then we've got an issue with the lymphatic system. And I know in our space, it's oftentimes been, okay, chronic edema equals lymphedema. And I still, for the most part, agree with it. It's just, I've been i um, interested in some of my conversations with um, physicians over time where it's, we might not have a lymphatic failure at that point. We may not always want to call it lymphedema, but we're still dealing with the same. So if someone's not comfortable with calling anything chronic edema, lymphedema, I'm okay with that. I, it's just helpful for people to realize there's a lymphatic strain. There's a strain on the lymphatic system because what we just talked about. If there's, for whatever the reason, there's an increase in fluid and there's a lack of ability for the body to maintain its hemodynamic stability, um, it's going to keep straining that lymphatic system until, as we all know, it will eventually fail. Um, so as, as common with uh, chronic venous insufficiency, where a lot of the vascular doctors now are recognizing, yeah, I got to treat when that patient's at a level of C3 um, meaning they're just starting to show and report signs of swelling by the end of the day, not wait 5, 10, 15 years for those, that swelling to go away when they elevate their leg. Um, sorry, to wait the, the duration of time so that the swelling that used to go away by morning time no longer goes away. So, okay. So back onto the compression piece. Um, redu potentially reduces pain and edema, increases that joint movement, increases functional movement, promotes tissue healing, and good. The clausal statement is what we were just chatting about earlier: is adequate compression. And uh, I'll leave it at that. I think I might have to speed on here. Okay, so um, now let's go back to this carpal tunnel uh, release and post-operative manage after carpal tunnel release. I. Um, and speaking from a family, uh, a recent family um, example, but I have a family member who two weeks ago had a bilateral carpal tunnel release. And before she had her bilateral carpal tunnel release, we did training on how to wrap and she purchased short stretch bandages. She had also gone on and gotten herself two gauntlets um, to be able to have once she was able to transition out of those short stretch bandages. And she and, and trained her her uh, spouse as well, and with that she did super well. Um, she's progressing very well through it. It's been quite exciting. Again, this is an N of one, but when she went to her doctor for her post op visit earlier this week, it was on Monday. She was so excited. She's like, "Look how much I can do." Um, she's we talked about not overstraining um, the the tissue with too much function, but doing a lot of the exercises. She was she was on par with all that. She's going to ask the doctor if she could see a, a hand specialist because there wasn't any talk about that preoperatively. There wasn't any talk about compression. It was just more of go home, um, keep this bandage on to keep to uh, for a few days, and then you can take it off and and just do whatever kind of just as you're able to. 
Well, that's not what she did. She did all that wrapping, like I was just mentioning. She goes to the post-op visit, feeling great, has had very minimal pain throughout this whole process. And, um, and her doctor just kind of said, hey, why, uh, why are you wearing compression? And, um, and ultimately, um, she, my family member responded back, well, it's been helping me. And she didn't, my family member didn't say anything more in the post-op visit, mainly because I kind of prepped her for, I don't know if this is going to be something they're going to be familiar with or not. If they have any questions, you could just, um, uh, listen, ask them why and listen to what they have to say. And then you can ascertain what you want to do. Well, she listened and, uh, and the doc says, you don't, you don't need compression. You don't have very much swelling. And, uh, the doc said, just, just keep, get on, keep, keep moving. And you can't do anything at this point to cause any trauma to the, to the surgery. So just kind of go ahead and get on with it. So my family member got told me later all of this. And she also said, I didn't say anything, but my doc said I didn't have any swelling but the nurse had me take my compression off about 10 minutes before the doctor came in. And she goes, my hands were swelling. She goes, and at first I looked down at my hands when my doc said I didn't have any swelling to say, uh, well, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just feeling that extra bit. But then she looked at her hands. She's like, no, my hands are swollen. Well, I had happened to um, mention that oftentimes the subtle swelling is sort of overlooked or just missed, um, not looking like it's too bad. And, uh, but don't worry about that. Just manage what you know. So she was already, and her spouse was already kind of prepared for that. But then she said, as soon as she left, she put her compression wraps back on. And then we talked about the next phases for continual, um, ultimate titration and in, in, into her, um, her compression garments, which right now feel a little bit too tight for her. Uh, but when I was talking with her about it, I go, you, your body's already told you what you need right now. You like the compression and you keep doing with that. And then every couple of days you can keep checking much like what we already know. We titrate off of it because we know this is short term. This is not a lymphatic problem. We're not going to worry about lymphedema. All we're trying to do is to support the post-operative swelling, support the recovery with range of motion, function, movement. And certainly it's nice to not have as many days of pain as possible. So um, anyway, again, an N of one. And with that and any of the different experiences, there's a whole host of options for wrapping and what needs to happen. Um, the short stretch bandages are great. And then also if the fingers are gonna be something, we just have to kind of adapt and address um, all the digits. Like we already know for lymphatic specialists, we'd be helping other clinicians understand that as well so that um, anything distal to that doesn't have any backflow. And much like how we teach our patients to be looking for backflow, if they're doing something like the hand on the left here where the, the, the digits are not, or maybe even the knuckles aren't that well um, covered, uh, just to be looking for backflow. And if we got backflow, no problem, but here's how we're going to adjust to it. We'll, we'll wrap more distally as well. So now kind of going back to the post-op management for total knee replacements, um, same kind of component. We actually, once I became trained as a lymphedema specialist, I think I mentioned to you that I was a, did lots of total knee replacement. It wasn't my only thing, but we kind of helped rotate at the other hospital that I used to be at. We started using the short stretch bandages and man, we thought we had good outcomes before. We had better outcomes after giving that type of compression support. Before that, we were using the good old traditional TED hose where a lot of our patients had their TED hose hanging out down below their surgical um, incision, which I'm sure any of you who have been a part of that know, and it's kind of chuckling and, and funny all together. Um, so again, another whole host of a variety of short stretch compression bandages that are available. Okay, and I know we know all this stuff, but if it were possible, if it were needed, there's also a whole host of adjustable compression that would um, be there. And it's faster to apply, awesome, a little bit more costly. So it just kind of depends. And we'd be helping our providers understand where they can get it, or if they're in an ortho group or a group where they wanna have that supply within their space to just automatically give to patients, um, that's another option, of course, too. So then lastly, as I'm going to wrap up here, I know I've talked mostly where it seems like it's in the ortho space. I want to kind of call us also to the concepts of um, oncology and these intentional surgeries to manage on um, uh, any type of cancer. So I'm going to right now just highlight breast cancer, but it could be anywhere along the continuum here. 
um, it's, it's helpful for us to uh, work with our providers, our surgeons to understand, hey, I know that the patient's electing for this surgery and we can kind of use the word elective with an open hand here because um, it's cancer and nobody's not going to probably move forward with what really needs to happen. But we could treat this similar to an orthopedic elective procedure, meaning, especially if we're talking like breast cancer here, we know the literature for um, post-operative swelling. Well, actually, the literature is not as strong on that one, but the literature for the range of motion and the scapular um, limitations that can occur and the pain that can occur. And so us thinking as therapists, if we get at that patient early on after surgery and not waiting until something happens or not waiting until uh, swelling is not going away or actually results in uh, lymphedema, and even if they're very good at identifying lymphedema in the oncology space, Arguably, you could say, why when, you know, before radiation, during radiation, that, that patient should be somehow already connected with um, a therapist to help them through the, and navigate um, in their post rehabilitation phase. They had surgery, they had radiation, they're going through a lot. Well, the earliest of management for um, breast swelling, this post operative swelling, is what I want to just highlight here. And these are just examples, but where we've actually kind of moved with our space is our docs having them automatically go to the fitter before surgery for their post-operative garments. And that fitter is um, able to then get the insurance because the insurance covers for post-operative compression. They're able to um, then submit for that post-operative need. They get it pre-operatively. They're able to take it to the OR. The docs are able to put it on immediately. And this is just one example um, since it, actually can continue to extend. It's, it's very versatile for a variety of uh, patients. But I know there's a lot of things that are out there. I think I've got more pictures. Oh, um, also kind of even with the potential of adding in a swell spot. Um, and depending upon what you might have around, some of our patients with the fitter are able to actually get those also approved through their insurance uh, preoperatively for the postoperative management. So I just wanted to kind of throw that in there. Um, so the key pieces are what's our opportunities for with our working with our oncologists and our sur surgical oncologists for addressing postoperative swelling. And I know here I'm just highlighting some components for what we could talk with our docs about for breast cancer surgery, but really we can translate it to any of the other types of, of surgeries that are going on and thinking more of these cancer surger surgeries as procedures where they should be tapped into ideally a therapist straight away following to help guide them back to their rehabil their, their, their previous function. Um, we're talking about shoulder girdle for breast and, and um, breast um, swelling and of course being mindful and surveilling for any arm swelling should it exist. But when we get into the gynecological surgeries and, I, and it doesn't always feel like it crosses a joint but man, so many patients, their digestive system is off. There's a lot of swelling, difficult to ascertain there when it's in the core. Um, so all of these pieces are potential opportunities to be more proactive with our um, patients by having the surgeons be more aware for that immediate referral. Uh, and then, oh, here's an example just with CAMIs. CAMI compressions is another option. So as I summarize here, current research, limited and inconclusive, but doesn't necessarily mean that it's not um, something that should be. It's just that's where it sort of lays right now, um, but inconclusive for the application of lymphatic support strategies. None of the research, by the way, actually references it that way. That's just probably like the mindset of a lymphedema therapist. We're thinking, yeah, we're just going to do interventions that are going to support and optimize the lymphatic system. Uh, albeit, maybe it's compression is probably an easy one. It should be adequate, but there's a lot of other options like uh, we saw in the literature where people are using um, uh, pneumatic compression devices, but also that kinesio tape and manual lymphatic drainage. So changing the status quo would just basically be one patient at a time, one clinician at a time, where we're sharing our knowledge and trying to collaborate and, and to work together. Um, collaboration network, optimize um, patient care, especially in a hospital setting, if you've got that, but also in the community setting, there's different avenues for reaching out wherever you sort of um, see fit or based on where you're kind of, um, where you're situated for your, for where you provide therapy and the types of patients that come and see you. Okay. 
So I'm going to stop there. I'm sorry I talked as long as I did. I was hoping. Oh, we're not sorry at all. That was absolutely fantastic. You're such a great presenter. And I love the mix of studies and stories. You marry them both together so beautifully. You covered everything so well. We may not have many questions from the audience, but do feel free, anybody who's out there, to put them in the Q&A. You know, I talk to lymphedema patients all the time, and my heart goes out to them because they require so many different tools to manage their condition effectively, and we encourage them to manage it effectively. We at LymphaPress are in network with most insurances. We love working together with the doctor's offices to ensure that the patient's equipment is covered. With the talk of compression garments, I had to wonder, will the Lymphedema Treatment Act help to benefit the patients? And how soon will we be able to see that impact? And I'm sorry to throw that question at you, but- No, it's okay. Any ideas? I'm glad you actually mentioned it because I, I, I uh, messed around with whether or not I should even mentioned to anyone who happens to be on the call and didn't realize that the lymphedema act had been passed. And I still have my fingers crossed for 2024 kind of moving forward as we, we see it. Um, but for our patients where we've got, um, cancer and anyone else on the call that you've got even more information than I do, but the patients where we've been fitting folks into garments, it seems like it should work. What I am not positive about is everything I just talked about from the acute injury uh, the post-operative, it's going to depend. Like for instance, breast cancer, there's already um, insurance coverage for many and Medicare will follow suit with the lymphedema act here and being passed with, no, actually Medicare already does this. Sorry, my bad. Medicare already provides for um, post-operative um, compression bras. It's just sort of that mindset of we don't have to wait until mm -hmm. after the surgery to get the proper garment, especially if we're working with a fitter who knows the surgeons and um, can then help with um, billing it in that post-operative setting because the patient's only receiving it for the post-operative needs, if that makes sense. So I think the, the yeah. lymphedema act will help tremendously. So I'm super excited about it. Where it will fit within the acute setting of like acute injuries and, and where they should be short lived, I don't know that answer. Well, it remains to be seen, but it's wonderful that so many people are working toward the goal of shifting the paradigms and, and working outside of those silos and collaborating. That's all so important. I love that you mentioned that. I just put in chat and I just want to mention to everybody who's here as well. Limfa Press is always doing very interesting content. And we're going to have to have you back, Paula, because I've been reading news about some other research that you've done in the world of lipedema, I believe it is. So mm -hmm. exciting. Yep. Yeah. You got a little, you want to give me a little something, something there on that? For the lipedema stuff? Yeah, it's, I, I, I think that, um, that I'm excited to see more and more clinicians be aware of it yes. and reach out to us. So again, I'm, I'm in a, a setting where it's a medical organization, but, um, after a recent article that happened to go out internally, and I didn't honestly think anyone read it. Um, we were highlighting my colleague who got the first NIH grant for lipedema, which was quite exciting. Um, and she's had that for a little over uh, a year now, but it just kind of came up in, in our, what we call Vanderbilt Reporter. And um, and so our, we, our weight loss um, physicians and that sort of reaching out to us, because we're, we're, we're slowly but surely wanting to continue to increase the collaboration. It just takes time and and time is not always something that everyone has a lot of, but what's nice is, um, you know, we can, and I was suggesting that we reach out to our community friends, right? And we can do that, but if they're not ready to hear it or, or listen to it, um, we planted the seed, but it's really helpful once they come back to us. And so again, like with this example, with the weight loss group for lipedema, they're like, we want help in understanding lipedema. And that's yeah. fantastic. So we've got a it meeting is. all together in two weeks time. So Well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you. And I, I know I, I sort of threw you a curveball there, but I appreciate <laughs> you speaking to it because it was something you didn't think anybody would read. It was all over the place. People were excited about it and it was a real to a top, a buzzworthy topic. Yeah, um, lipedema is becoming more and more uh, just at least heard about, recognized, and then kind of hopefully from there, the science will follow and treatments yes. will improve. 
Yeah. Absolutely. So we do have lymphedema and lipedema patient roundtables every month. Our link is in the chat here. And then on the first Monday of every month, I want to do this little commercial. We do a research roundtable. And many of the people that are here watching this would be very interested in our March 6th topic, which is fibrosis. Karen Ashforth and Dr. Karen Herbst are leading the discussion. It will be not a presentation. It will be a different format than this. Lots of free flowing conversation, lots of chat. So if you want an interactive conversation, please join us on the first Monday of every month for the research roundtable. Dr. Eva Sevek is going to be with us for lymphatics of the brain in April. So we've got lots going on, but Paula, that's awesome. You. You're doing a fantastic job. I love what content you're, you're providing. It's amazing. Well, it's wonderful to partner with people like you and appropriate to start, sort of start Lymphedema Awareness Month with someone like you. So thank you for all that you're doing for the community. And thanks everybody for tuning in. You will get a link to the replay and it will be posted on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. So take care, everyone. And thanks for joining us. See you, Paula. Thank you for having me. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.